When you say border security, most people's minds go south. But what about the miles of border between Canada and New England? If Homeland Security is really concerned with security and the biggest security threat is terrorism, we should be more worried about the Canadian border than the Mexican border. From the New England News Collaborative, this is Next. I'm John Dankosky. We dig into illegal border crossing in Vermont, New Hampshire, and New York. Plus, we'll explore how New England's history is uniquely rooted in the shipping industry. Although they weren't naturally mariners, the original New Englanders turned to the one place that offered them opportunity, which was, of course, through shipping and through fishing. But what does the future hold for Northeast ports? And the iconic New England brand, L.L. Bean, is finding unlikely success because of the booming outdoors trend in Japan. The trend just continued to grow, and L.L. Bean and other clothing companies uh, took advantage. It's next. Next is powered by the New England News Collaborative. Eight public media companies coming together to tell the story of a changing region with support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. You hear a lot of news about the nation's southern border, but what about security on New England's border with Canada? Some people believe that when it comes to border security, the nation should focus on the potential for terrorists to enter the U.S. from the north. Lauren Madelon reports on the potential security threats along the northern border. Customs and Border Protection pilot Gerhard Perry flies along the northern border, where Vermont, New Hampshire, and New York meet Canada. He flies an infrared camera-equipped Cessna on patrols that can last up to four hours. When people ask him about his work, he always has to explain, it's the northern border. When you ask the average American citizen about the border, what do you know about the border? They immediately go to the southern border. They don't even think about our border with Canada. Before his northern deployment, Perry flew borderland missions in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas, a mix of river, bramble, thicket, and border towns. So he knows both borders well and says you also have to look north. You have large population centers within 100 miles of the border. You have Toronto, you have Montreal, where these organizations may be operating. If you're going to address terrorism, the northern border is, is where to look. Perry was in the air in 2014 when word came about an act of terrorism that changed Canada, and with it a review of terrorism threats in Canada and security on its border. This is CNN Breaking News. A Canadian soldier has died after being run down by a car driven by a suspected Islamic militant. First, a soldier was murdered in a deliberate hit and run near Montreal. The same week, an ISIS supporter killed a soldier at Canada's war memorial. He then entered Canada's parliament where he was shot dead. In his cockpit, Gerhard Perry pulled in the signal from an AM radio. As I'm flying, I'm looking over and this occurred just a few miles from where, from where we were. I was horrified. I was like, good grief, in Canada? There are about 16,000 border patrol agents on the Mexico border. There are about 2,000 on the Canada border, which is twice as long as Mexico's. The U.S. attorney for the District of Vermont, Christina Nolan, says she has concerns about the northern border. One of the first things that naturally comes to mind is what we know to be certain radicalized um, populations in, in Montreal and other parts of Canada. And we know about Nolan recently met with Canadian prosecutors. They indicated to me they had a healthy docket of cases pending that involved homegrown radicals who were attempting to travel overseas and fight for ISIS. In response, Canada has made preemptive arrests. In the past three years, at least 10 students have been arrested before leaving Montreal allegedly to join ISIS. An alleged ISIS cell was uncovered in Ottawa in 2015, and in another case, a Kuwaiti-born Canadian has pleaded guilty to plotting attacks for ISIS in New York. In November, Canada's Minister of Public Safety, Ralph Goodale, revealed the number of people who've come back from places like Afghanistan. The number of returnees known to the government of Canada is in the order of, of 60. Canada's intelligence service also says it knows of 180 people with ties to Canada engaged in terrorism activity abroad, with about half believed to be in Syria or Iraq. We overemphasize security on the southern border and we don't emphasize enough security on the northern border. That's security specialist Howard Campbell at the University of Texas at El Paso, across the Rio Grande from Juarez, Mexico. His book, Drug War Zone, looks at trafficking in both cities. If Homeland Security is really concerned with security and the biggest security threat is terrorism, we should be more worried about the Canadian border than the Mexican border. President Trump's portrayed a southern border that's under siege. He's stated that drugs and undocumented migrants are pouring into the country. 
He's made that assertion even as the administration's latest statistics for April show illegal border crossings held steady last month and that illegal crossings are in line with historical trends. In El Paso, Howard Campbell says people arrested crossing in from Mexico may be committing an illegal act, but he says they typically pose no threat of terrorism. Because Mexican and Central American migrant workers are not a terrorist threat to the United States. Canada's 2018 budget includes $173 million for greater security along the U.S. border. Intelligence sharing between the U.S. and Canada is robust, with a longer tradition of mutual trust than between the U.S. and Mexico. And that could mean U.S. law enforcement's presence on the northern border might continue to be dwarfed by what Washington has committed to the south. You're listening to Next. I'm John Dankosky, and that was reporter Lauren Matalong on the U.S. border with Canada. Border Patrol agents arrested 20 people for entering the country illegally in Vermont, New Hampshire, and New York in just one weekend in April. Helping people cross the border illegally or human smuggling is something people take for granted along the southern border, but it's also part of life on the northern border, where human smugglers and law enforcement are playing a cat-and-mouse game. Here's Lauren again. Richard Ross is the agent in charge of the U.S. Border Patrol station in Newport. He's a native Vermonter who worked previously in borderland Texas. Ross says the volumes may be smaller and often the profiles different, but he says human smuggling from Canada on the northern border is a constant. It absolutely is sophisticated and organized. Ross runs one of eight stations in the Border Patrol's Swanton sector. The sector covers Vermont and parts of New Hampshire and New York. There's boundless tree cover, rivers, and large lakes like Champlain and Memphremagog with shoreline in both countries. If you have that type of transnational criminal organization, this area is very appealing. In October, three people were charged in federal court with allegedly orchestrating a 15-person human smuggling attempt that used a Vermont motel as a way station. In November, two Americans seen circling an area near the border were charged with smuggling two Mexicans. Then in February and twice in March, Border Patrol agents intercepted similar smuggling attempts. We have had two groups that happen to be Romanian drive vehicles. Two of the three cases unfolded beside the Haskell Free Library and Opera House in Derby Line, Vermont, which faces Stansted, Quebec. Outside the library, a street with a simple marker and some flower pots marks the border. There's just enough room for a car to squeeze between the marker and the state of Vermont. So they came right up here over the sidewalk, came out here, took a left, and Interstate 91 is about a minute away. Last year, agents in the Swanton sector arrested 165 people trying to enter the U.S. illegally. That's a 22% decline over 2016 when 214 people were caught. But Border Patrol intelligence agent Rob Dandro says business is still good so, for human smugglers. You know, we've seen that these organizations can sometimes charge individuals anywhere from two to even upwards of twenty-five, thirty thousand dollars. The cost in Mexico between three and eight thousand. Dandro says human smuggling needs accomplices on both sides. They will usually recruit drivers and foot guides, whether it be in the U.S. and Canada, usually both countries, to actually do the physical smuggling themselves. Agent Ross says they also use scouts. We'd be foolish to think that we were running our operations and they weren't running any against us to see where they could cross and when they could cross. Canada is trying to better track who comes in and out of the country, and it's working with the U.S. to do so. Canada has begun sharing data with the U.S. on American citizens who cross into Canada. Legislation in Canada would also establish exit controls. Without them, the government says it has no reliable way of knowing if visitors ever leave the country. David Berger is a Canadian immigration lawyer who served for 16 years in Canada's parliament. He says people will swipe their passport as they exit Canada. And we will have a record of when they leave the country. We've never had that before. And we will share that information with presumably the United States. After the presidential election of November 2016, a number of people began entering Canada illegally from the U.S. Back in Vermont, Border Patrol agent in charge Richard Ross says agents are expecting a boomerang. And some of those folks have realized that they're not going to be allowed to stay in Canada. So we are seeing some of that traffic come back to us. Canada's announced that it will allow a million migrants into the country between now and 2020. Not all will end up staying permanently. 
Those who guard the northern border say that almost certainly means some of them will take their chances with human smugglers to try and enter the U.S. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Lorne Madelon. Earlier this month, the Vermont Supreme Court overturned the conviction of a man who pleaded guilty to leaving Ku Klux Klan flyers at the homes of two women of color. The court said the state didn't prove that the action met the threshold of, quote, threatening behavior. As Liam Elder Connors of Vermont Public Radio reports, this decision highlights the tension around protecting speech, even when it's potentially threatening or harmful. In 2015, two women, one African-American and one who identifies herself as Mexican, found the flyers at their homes. None of their white neighbors had gotten them. The flyers showed a robed Klansman holding a burning cross and the phrase, Join the Klan and Save Our Land. Police arrested and charged William Shank with two counts of disorderly conduct. He pleaded guilty, but the Supreme Court overturned his conviction. That doesn't sit right with Jabari Jones, a spokesperson for Black Lives Matter of Greater Burlington. Do they have to tie the note to a rock and throw it through their window and then throw a Molotov cocktail at it? Like, how obvious does the threat have to be to be taken seriously, particularly, it seems, if it's threats against people of color? In its decision, the court said prosecutors didn't prove that Shank's actions went far enough under Vermont's disorderly conduct statute to be a threat. Jared Carter is an assistant professor at Vermont Law School. Carter said the state had to prove that Shank's actions— leaving the flyers, constituted an immediate threat to the two women. And that since the activities here were primarily speech, the delivery of some flyers, uh, heinous flyers, but speech nonetheless, the state, as a matter of fact and a matter of law, could not meet its burden of proof. The state argued that given the KKK's history of violence and because the individuals who got the flyers were people of color, Shank's conviction should stand. VPR couldn't reach the two women who received the flyers, but according to court records, both said the incident scared them. One said, based on the history of the KKK, she feared for her safety. Jones, with Black Lives Matter of Greater Burlington, says the court's decision ignores the KKK's extensive history of violence and intimidation. And so if we can't look at white supremacist terrorist speech in that context, then what we're doing is actually reinforcing and upholding white supremacist violence. But the American Civil Liberties Union of Vermont says it's a matter of protecting all free speech. Staff attorney Jay Diaz says in this case, the speech isn't a threat. You know, when you have a a hate group doing things like this and people are afraid, how do we reconcile that with our longstanding traditions of free political speech? The group filed a brief supporting the dismissal of Shank's charges. And Diaz says the KKK is a hate organization, and the ACLU condemns its actions. However, we want to be careful not to uh, allow the criminalization of speech that uh, gets to political issues. Our country has a long history of criminalizing political speech for organizations that we support, uh, such as the NAACP and, and many others. So we want to be very careful with that because the First Amendment, in the end, protects everybody. Protecting free speech and protecting individuals is difficult for courts, says law professor Jared Carter. The Vermont Supreme Court has decided to deal with this case on simply interpreting the statute rather than reaching these bigger questions of how far can we limit speech? Is this particular activity by Mr. Shank uh, constitutionally protected or not? Carter says those questions are left for another day. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Liam Elder Connors. In Arlington, Massachusetts, the community is still healing after officials found anti-gay and anti-Semitic graffiti at the high school earlier this month. While the incident came as a shock to many there, this type of vandalism is becoming more common in schools across Massachusetts. Carrie Young from WBUR's Edify desk reports that this trend has prompted administrators from Arlington High School to explore new ways to handle and prevent these crimes. When graffiti and other vandalism was first discovered at Arlington High School, it didn't take long for news to spread. My friend told me about it. This is Olivia Weiss, a senior at Arlington High. It was scary as a young member of the Jewish community to hear that there had been a swastika painted on my school. Weiss didn't see the images firsthand, but she says she didn't have to rely on the rumor mill at school for long. Our principal sent out a pretty um, long email to all of the students about what had happened. 
In the past, schools may have quietly cleaned up the graffiti so as not to draw attention to the incident, but that's changing. Robert Treston, the regional director of the Anti-Defamation League, says schools are opting for more transparency and quick communication with the community. When they see hate, more and more people are recognizing it as something that needs to be dealt with promptly and in an upfront manner. Treston says part of that has to do with the fact that administrators are seeing hate more in schools. In 2017, the Anti-Defamation League counted about 90 anti-Semitic incidents in Massachusetts schools, up from about 50 in 2016. State data on hate crimes tells a similar story. In 2016, about 18 percent of all hate crimes occurred in schools, an increase from about 12 percent from the year before. Education is the best prevention tool that we have. Treston says a growing number of districts are integrating anti-bias curriculum into their classes. Organizations like the Anti-Defamation League and the NAACP are partnering with schools to develop and implement these programs. And according to Treston, these services are in high demand. In the course of a two-year period, we're, we're adding over 50 schools to our program, which is, that's a significant increase. But it's also a reflection of what is happening out there in the communities. This is something that we're growing within the district uh, in a very formal way. Sarah Ahern is the superintendent of the Franklin Public Schools. In 2017 alone, she says the district saw three incidents of racist vandalism on school grounds. We've had a couple swastikas uh, located in our bathrooms, as well as a few swastikas on playground structures or on sidewalks uh, displayed in chalk. Ahern says the middle school grades have already launched an anti-bias curriculum. Instead of relying solely on teachers, though, the program has students lead conversations and develop inclusive environments. School leaders are now hoping to expand the program into the high school system. We see this type of anti-bias work uh, in our um, kind of diverse culture as being very intricately connected to developing social and emotional skills that will leave students more prepared um, to go out into the world of work uh, and future education. Weiss says the money will be donated to the Friends of Arlington High School Fund, where she hopes it will be used for efforts that promote healing instead of further division. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Carrie Young. Since Carrie's report, Arlington High School identified 14 students who are accused of writing a swastika in anti-gay slurs on the school. And the high school is offering a way for them to avoid criminal charges by enrolling in a program called Restorative Justice. In consultation with human rights organizations, the accused students will be offered the chance to take part in a program that will give them the opportunity to meet with victims of vandalism and discuss ideas about possible restitution. Coming up, the history and the future of the shipping industry in New England. It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the Common Sense Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate change and global warming. There's only one ferry operator that transports vehicles between mainland Massachusetts and Martha's Vineyard, the Steamship Authority. So it's not surprising that the hundreds of cancellations this year have led to public outcry from residents and workers stranded with no alternative transportation. The dispute between frustrated riders and Steamship Authority management came to a head at a public meeting in Martha's Vineyard earlier this month, with the authority's board moving to hire an outside firm to audit its entire operation. WBUR's Simone Rios sent us this report from the island shortly after that meeting. Walter Gillette runs an insulation company based in Bourne. He travels from the mainland to Martha's Vineyard twice a week to deliver supplies and oversee his workers. In all the 30 years he's been making the trip, Gillette says he's never seen this kind of scheduling mess. We were doing a job last month and we couldn't get guys over here and then we couldn't get guys off the island at the end of the day. So it was, uh, it was a nightmare. Mechanical problems have caused 549 cancellations this year alone on the line between Woods Hole and Martha's Vineyard. That compares to just 26 cancellations all of last year. For people who depend on the ferry for work, that can translate into losses. Gillette says his workers punch in on the mainland and only punch out when they return, so every hour of delay is another hour of pay. He says that's cost his company about $1,000. 
But unlike a lot of people on the vineyard, Drillet says he still has faith in the steamship authority, which operates the ferry. I think it's a fluke. I think that they probably are uh, very concerned about how things have gone. Because generally they do a great job. People here are good people and they try uh, to get you on a boat. That sentiment is far from universal these days. As Drillette and a colleague were waiting in their work van for the ferry back to the mainland, roughly 200 vineyard residents were making their way to the monthly board meeting of the Steamship Authority. The meeting was originally scheduled to be held in Nantucket, but public pressure on the vineyard drove the board to meet here instead and face an angry public demanding a top-to-bottom audit of the agency. Steamship Authority General Manager Robert Davis opened the meeting with an apology. I'm the general manager. I'm responsible for, for making sure that the services that you depend upon, that the island residents, the local merchants, the commuters, the shippers and island visitors come to rely on every day. And, um, you know, it's embarrassing that we were in this position where we weren't able to do that. The notion of the ferry as a lifeline came up countless times during last night's meeting. We need our lifeline. Here's Gene Rogers of Vineyard Haven. Three times forced to pay for hotel rooms. Been forced to leave my car three separate times in Palmer because I couldn't get my car back on the boat and get the kids back to school and me back to work that next day. This is our lifeline. We need this fixed. So whatever you people have to do, you need to do it. While some islanders seized the opportunity to vent about the inconveniences brought to their lives, others talked about the deeper significance of ferry service to the island economy. Peter Wharton of Oak Bluffs is a commissioner at the airport. We have 700,000 gallons of fuel that we get every single year. The majority of that's during season, and that comes over in 88 trucks. And if those trucks aren't delivered, then we can't fly. If we can't fly, your impact becomes our impact. A recent poll by the Martha's Vineyard Gazette found that 65% of year-round vineyard residents think ferry service is worse now than it was a year ago. And 77% believe the steamship authorities should be subjected to an independent audit. Many at the meeting were upset that the board had rejected an earlier proposal to do so. But board members say they had to reject it because it named one company to do the audit instead of putting it out to bid. Last night, the proposal was revamped and brought again by Mark Hanover, the Martha's Vineyard representative on the board. I know what we need and I know what I want. And that is a complete review of the entire Steamship Authority, the operational discipline, the IT, the public communications, management structure, and uh, fleet maintenance. And that's, that's my motion. This time, Hanover's plan was to solicit proposals in an open process. Now, the board was united. We'll take a roll call vote. Jones, aye. Vlad Folter, aye. Ranny, aye. Tierney, aye. Hanover, aye. Okay, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Next, it'll be up to the Steamship Authority to request proposals for an audit. That could be approved at its next monthly meeting. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Simon Rios on Martha's Vineyard. Every beach community has a story about a shipwreck, a boat that didn't make it to port. These stories mostly exist as folklore, not as current events. But in 2015, a giant container ship sank on a routine route between Florida and Puerto Rico during Hurricane Joaquin. 33 mariners died in that wreck, eight of whom were from New England. Boston-based journalist Rachel Slade digs into the causes of this wreck, as well as the history and future of the global shipping industry, in her new book, Into the Raging Sea, 33 Mariners, One Megastorm, and the Sinking of El Faro. Rachel Slade, welcome to Next. Thanks for joining us. Thank you so much. So what's at the root of this? Whenever a, a ship goes straight into a hurricane, you can imagine a lot of reasons why, maybe some sort of failure of communication, some sort of breakdown, or, or as you chronicle, a lot of pressures to get this cargo from one place to the other. What, what are the main causes of why this happened? When I started writing this book, I thought of the working title as how many mistakes does it take to sink a ship? And the answer is almost countless. But there are a few major factors here. One of them, yes, absolutely, it was there was pressure on this captain. Um, he had recently been passed over for a promotion. He felt his job slipping away from him. That was one thing that was on him. The other problem was the forecasting of this hurricane. This 
particular hurricane um, ended up being one of the anomalies for the National Hurricane Center. And in fact, their forecasts were um, historically off for this particular storm. They thought that it would cut north, as most of our storms do in the Atlantic, and this one didn't. It defied their predictions. It went southwest. It continued going southwest. It moved very slowly. In fact, it really lumbered. It was moving at about four knots for days, and it just sat there feasting off of the very warm waters of the Atlantic, unusually hot waters of the Atlantic that time of year. Maybe you can give us an overview of just how big and how important the shipping industry is to the United States right now. So we think of the Internet as connecting us all. That's only partly true. In fact, the backbone of the global economy is shipping. And it's not just American shipping. It's global shipping. Ninety percent, it's estimated, of everything that we touch from the clothes on our backs to the parts in our car to the phone in your pocket, 90 percent of everything that we own spent some time on a container ship. So you can just imagine how important shipping is. And when you think about what happened to Puerto Rico after Hurricane Maria, when the ships were having trouble getting through and they were having trouble then on the island distributing goods once they landed in port, even now you can see um, when when logistics are down, chaos can ensue. Mm. I, I want to go back to the, the early days of, of New England and its role in the shipping industry. You write that New Englanders were global citizens. Southern planters waited for the world to come to them. We think about the early American colonies being split between the North and the South and all of the, the stuff that the South had to offer the world, cotton and tobacco. But you write that New Englanders had little to sell but an intrepid spirit. I, I love that idea. To Tell us more about that. I don't know how the Southern, Southerners feel about this, but I know I'm talking <laughs> to friends here. So, um, yeah, the, the South was really not terribly interested in logistics, but, man, the Northerners really were. I mean, when we first arrived here or when, when those folks who did first arrived here, you know, we didn't really have arable soil um, or the soil wasn't that great. The winters were very harsh. And so although they weren't naturally mariners, the original New Englanders turned to the one place that offered them opportunity, which was, of course, through shipping and through fishing. So that's why we developed this huge whaling industry, first in Nantucket, then in Martha's Vineyard and, and New Bedford. Um, but we also became the world's shippers. Now, what was great about being a New England shipper before um, the establishment of the United States was that they could kind of go rogue. You know, they were they were nominally citizens of Britain, but we were so far away that they felt like they could open up new trade routes and not too worry too much about the crown catching up to them. And so actually, a lot of the big families first were known in Salem, Newburyport, and, and Boston for sailing around South America, up along the, the Pacific Northwest, picking up furs from the Native Americans there, and then trading in Canton and other places in Asia. Those were routes that, that nobody else had really invested in before the colonists put, put their sails to the wind. And that really shaped all of that history that you just laid out. It really shaped what uh, New England, uh, Massachusetts, Maine, Connecticut, and, and Rhode Island, what what these places actually looked like. There was, there was more of a, a global flavor. There were, were more products and more people coming from all over the world. The, the shipping industry, I, I assume, uh, Rachel, really, really shaped what our entire region is, is like. Absolutely. I, I think they were if you will, more sophisticated than, than other folks down the coast. I also am fascinated by the idea that there was a tremendous amount of social mobility in that model because, you know, there was no uh, standardized investment system. And so essentially communities would invest in these ships. And originally, no matter who you were, whether you were the cabin boy or the captain, you had a certain cut of the profits of the ship. So everybody was invested. And that meant that if you had a lucrative run, you could, in theory, move up the chain, move up the commanding ladder, and eventually have your own ship. And we see that over and over again. Um, folks in Maine starting out 
just, you know, as as a deckhand 12 years old and then uh, 40 years later retiring as a captain with an enormous house and, and a large family and uh, lots of money in the bank. And sometimes they became very politically powerful as well. I want to spin this forward to to the modern shipping industry and, and talk a bit about some of the pressures facing it. You already talked about one. The storm that took down the El Faro is one of a series of stronger than normal hurricanes that have hit the Atlantic Ocean over the course of the last several years. It's caused an enormous amount of damage on land. And as we've seen also at sea, climate change is in part the cause of this. I'm wondering how the shipping industry is adapting to the the problems of of climate change right now. What I'd like to stress here is that, of course, the oceans have always had this um, warming cycle throughout the summer. The ocean, the Atlantic, collects heat from the sun. That heat is the fuel for hurricanes. A tropical low will come down over the warm waters and then, you know, start sucking up the heat and becoming a cyclone and either dissipating or um, growing stronger into a stronger and stronger hurricane. What is, what's important to understand here is that now we don't just have a warm layer of water in the Atlantic. We have a very deep, hot layer. So that means that when the tropical low begins to form and when the cyclone begins to form, it has a much deeper source of fuel. Joaquin fed off of that depth of heat Um, And that's why it moved so slowly and did not pull north as expected. It just sat there and sat there and sat there because there was so much depth that even as it churned up the oceans, it wasn't getting cooler. It wasn't getting cooler. It was continuing to feed off of the depth of the heat. As much as climate change introduces uncertainty and problems for the shipping industry, there's potentially a, an opportunity opening up because of, of the melting of Arctic ice. Is, is there a chance that we've created more shipping lanes that might advantage New England ports in the near future? So this is an absolutely huge story. The ice is melting, and, um, you know, you can look at it any number of ways. I mean, it's certainly um, a sign of of climate change. But in the next 10 years, it's predicted that we will actually have regular container ship routes from Asia to Europe cutting across, across the Arctic. And that is absolutely huge. It would take only about 22 days to get um, a cargo ship from Japan to Europe. That's, that's, um, that's at least a week less than what it takes right now. I predict that this is going to have an enormous impact on New England because if the, if this becomes a truly viable route, which I assume eventually it will if the ice continues to melt as it is, then Portland is going to start to look a lot like L.A. does now. So right now, of course, ships come to L.A. L.A. is an enormous port. I mean, just it's it's the largest port in America. But they're, they're coming to L.A. and then they're redistributing cargo, putting them on, on smaller ships or now sometimes even bigger ships coming through Panama Canal, coming up to um, – New York and Savannah and um, Houston and all those places. So L.A. is just a a major feeder port for for all of America or all of distribution from Asia. Imagine now that the ships are no longer taking that route and are instead taking the northern route. Will Portland, Maine or Portsmouth, New Hampshire become the next L.A. port? And what would it take for those cities to actually become that. Uh, Los Angeles, aside from the fact that it's located in such a place that it could be that feeder port, it's also a a gigantic American city. These these little uh, New England towns are, well, they're mid-sized cities, but they're not L.A. How how do you get a Portsmouth or a Portland to, to become that? Obviously, it would take an enormous investment on, obviously, a shipper's size, but also the cities, the federal government. I mean, around the world, especially in Asia, countries subsidize their shipping industry. They understand the importance of shipping for their own economies. We do much less of that. We have the Jones Act, which is more protectionist legislation, but we don't actually subsidize financially shipping in the same way. If the United States decided that this was an opportunity, or even if the region decided that this was an opportunity, you could certainly turn one of these areas into a major port city in very little time. It doesn't take a lot. 
you just need a lot of asphalt <laughs> and you need to get your cranes in place. Um, you know, you need these huge cranes, you need to dredge, but it really doesn't take a lot. People are doing this around the world constantly now. And then the next part, of course, is logistics on land. And I would assume that we would have to beef up our um, highway system, but also our rail system. Right now, of course, most of our stuff, almost everything in New England comes from New York, and that gets mostly trucked up. Now imagine everything's going the other way. Fixing up these cities to become uh, gigantic ports may be one thing, but actually getting our roads uh, and bridges fixed sounds like something that might be entirely different. I, and don't forget, yeah. I'm not saying that this is a good idea. <laughs> I'm saying it might be inevitable at some point. With all the research that you've done into this world of shipping, and, and of course the story of of these people who uh, died tragically on the ship. Do you think differently about the stuff that you use and where it comes from? Oh, absolutely. Now I have an understanding that people pack these boxes and then they pack these containers and then the containers have to get on the ships and then the ships have to get to here. And, you know, this handling, this loading and unloading and packing and unpacking, I mean, it takes a tremendous amount of work. And in fact, when we look at the prices of things, for example, a bottle of Evian water or, you know, a T-shirt made in, uh, say, you know, Vietnam, what's n what we might not be comprehending is that the real cost oftentimes is in the transportation, is in getting that thing there. And if the subsidies of the other countries were to end, would it change the import-export landscape of America? Would we then begin to see the pricing of imported goods rise? Because, in fact, logistics is so expensive, both environmentally and obviously from a labor and infrastructure standpoint. The book is called Into the Raging Sea, 33 Mariners, One Megastorm, and the Sinking of El Faro. And the author is Rachel Slade. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Coming up, how did L.L. Bean, the iconic New England brand, become big business in Japan? It's next. Next is made possible in part by our founding supporters who believe in the power of collaborative news coverage, including the John Merck Fund, supporting the New England News Collaborative in its coverage of climate and clean energy. For years, hours of videotaped interviews with survivors of the Holocaust sat packed away in a closet in Brookline, Massachusetts. Now, as Connecticut Public Radio's Patrick Scahill tells us, a filmmaker recently rescued those old tapes, weaving the dozens of interviews together into a living memorial for survivors. Harvey Brodman says he knew the Holocaust tapes would change his life, and that scared him. I was afraid of what I might hear. I was afraid I couldn't do it. Brothman is the director and producer of the film Soul Witness, the Brookline Holocaust Witness Project. These people went through great pains to tell these stories. And most of them had never told these stories to even their own family members. Brothman is talking about dozens of hours of interviews, recorded in the 1990s with Holocaust survivors living in Brookline. The original idea was to edit the interviews down, but for the town, it was a big and expensive task. Some of the raw recordings were sent to an archive at Yale University. Others went into storage, where they sat for over 20 years, until Lloyd Jelinu, the town's chief diversity officer, started going through the old stockpile. He soon learned the tapes were interviews with Holocaust survivors. And I'm like, oh my god, this is like, this has been sitting in my closet. Why haven't we done anything with it? So Jelinu got in touch with Brothman, who cleaned the tapes up, digitized them, and eventually spent hours watching and editing the interviews. The stories are gut-wrenching, like Rena Chernoff's, a survivor of Auschwitz who recalls the last time her mother and brother spoke. She says the Nazis were choosing numbers for people who they would kill. My mother asked my brother, did they take down your number? And my brother didn't answer at all. And he was nine years old at the time. And he just threw his piece of bread that he got to my mother over the fence, and he said, you take it. I won't need it anymore. Cheryl Lefman's father, Henry, is also in the film. 
Lefman says she watched some of his Holocaust testimony years ago when Henry taped his interview, but she couldn't get through it. It tore my heart apart. In this interview, Henry Lefman recalls a final conversation with his father, shortly before he was murdered. Remember, my son, you must live. You must survive. You must survive. And I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Cheryl Lefman's father did survive, emigrating to Massachusetts and eventually becoming an engineer. Lefman says for her father, the Brookline interviews fulfilled that final father-son promise. That he would live to tell the story of what happened in the Holocaust as well as to their family. So I think he would be tremendously proud Filmmaker Harvey Brovman says the hours of interviews reveal survivors detailing not just a historical legacy, but an emotional one. They wanted us to know about the people they lost. They, they wanted us to know that they loved them. And that they don't know why they were the only ones that survived. It's still hard to talk about. But survivors did talk about it, some telling their stories near the end of their lives. Building a living memorial, Brobman hopes will preserve these voices for years to come. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Patrick Scahill in Hartford. In Hartford, Puerto Rican families displaced by Hurricane Maria are adjusting to their new city. Some haven't had a chance to visit the local landmarks, so recently a group of evacuees was invited on a private tour of the home of one of Hartford's most famous residents. Connecticut Public Radio's Vanessa Dillatori takes us to the Mark Twain House and Museum. Under the pen name Mark Twain, which he learned while he was on the riverboats. So we're in the Mark Twain House and the tour guide shows a black and white photo of one of Mark Twain's young daughters. Soon everyone notices that Clara Clemens looks a lot like a five-year-old on the tour. Miliani Rivera. She's a Puerto Rican evacuee. And then there's Clara. Ahí está Clara. Do any of you know Miliani? Miliani, mira, te parece a ti? Yes. Miliani, mira. I saw it right away, too, by the way. Looks like you. Mira, mira. The five-year-old is a student at Sanchez Elementary School in Hartford. She came to this national landmark on a Saturday morning with her mom and other families from Puerto Rico, plus some translators from the Hartford schools. They climbed the stairs of this old house built in 1874. and learn that the famous man who used to live here had affection for their island. He did love to go down to the Caribbean. And he did visit Puerto Rico. Oh, he visited Puerto Rico. This field trip was months in the making. Hartford Superintendent Leslie Torres Rodriguez remembers talking to some of the evacuees in December. It was just a few months after Hurricane Maria ripped through Puerto Rico, the damage forcing out thousands of U.S. citizens who ended up in places like Hartford. They were wondering, you know, how, how am I going to get to know the community? You know, I don't feel like I belong. I don't feel like I will ever belong. The superintendent asked if they'd gone to any of the museums in Hartford, and they said no. So this topic brings up some memories for Torres Rodriguez because she visited the Mark Twain house as a kid around 1985. She was nine years old and new to Hartford, having just arrived from Puerto Rico. Fifth grade. Fifth grade, Burns Elementary. Um, first field trip. First field trip ever. Ever. Burns Elementary and Sanchez School are just a mile or so away from the Mark Twain house. Both of these schools received a big influx of evacuees after the hurricane last fall. So the superintendent says, why not invite the displaced families at Burns and Sanchez to this vintage Hartford place, the former home of Samuel Clemens, a.k.a. Mark Twain, the guy who wrote classics like Tom Sawyer and The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. This is the billiard room. This is where Sam, or Mark, wrote his most famous books. That's Grace Belanger. She works for the Mark Twain house. Belanger explains that Sam Clemens struggled with the direction of his life when he was younger, before he became a well-known author. Sanchez school employee Sally Vasquez is translating for the group. And he hated that job. He hated it. He really, really hated it. Vasquez is a translator, but it becomes clear that some of the children have learned enough English to translate too. So when he's older, he becomes a riverboat pilot. When he grew up, he was a pilot of... What? Of what? Of the river. 
After checking out the kitchen, the families step outside. Maria del Mar Morales is one of the parents displaced from Puerto Rico. She says the 144-year-old house seems like a nice place to live. But the home is so big, she says, it'd be hard to clean. Miliani also offers her opinion. She's the little girl who bears a striking resemblance to Clara Clemens. She said it's beautiful. As it turns out, the field trip was also an opportunity to network. The museum says it's looking for bilingual tour guides. For the New England News Collaborative, I'm Vanessa De La Torre. In the United States, L.L. Bean's sales have been largely stagnant, but that's not the case in Japan, where the store has found some unlikely success. Lori Valegra from the Bangor Daily News decided to explore why the outdoor store is becoming so popular in Japan in a recent article, and she joins us now. Lori, welcome to Next. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Before we start, you've actually spent some time in Japan, so you know what you're talking about, right? Well, I was stationed there um, as an overseas correspondent for five years. So, so you know a little bit about the culture, and, and, and you know what some of the trends are that, that people might be picking up on, at least those trends coming from America. It's a lot of what I enjoyed about being there, watching the trends. So talk about L.L. Bean and why you think it's seeing so much success in Japan right now. Well, there's been a push by the Japanese government to get the workers to take some time off and spend time with their families and do things. So this whole outdoor trend has been going on for maybe since 1992, and initially it, it took some unusual forms. For example, when I was there, I would see people driving around central Tokyo with surfboards on their car with no intention of using them in the water, but it was an outdoor trend to, bu- to buy that. So the, the trend just continued to grow, and L.L. Bean and other clothing companies uh, took advantage of Japanese people wanting to be outside and wanting to be dressed appropriately. But help me understand, is most of the trend about people wanting to appear as though they're about to spend time outside or people actually wanting to go hike out in the wilderness? It's now moved into people hiking into the wilderness. A lot of it's to find peace away from the city but also to be dressed fashionably and to be dressed to protect yourself against the weather. It has turned into a very active outdoor scene of both individuals, groups of people, and families. So what does a store in Japan look like compared to the L.L. Bean store that you'd find there in Maine? They're smaller, on average, maybe a third of the size, and they're very much curated, so only specific products that sell well will be handled in the store. You won't see the variety that you see here. I'm wondering if L.L. Bean can learn something for the American market from the success that it's had in Japan. I think they're already starting to do that. They are opening five new stores in the U.S. this year that are smaller stores, much smaller than their usual size here, and they are very much curated for the type of individuals in those areas that would be buying there. Is there a sense that L.O. Bean is going to expand internationally even more, seeing the success that they have in Japan? Is there a, a market in, in China or elsewhere in Asia for their products? They've actually retrenched from China. They did have some, it was over 30 stores. It might have been close to 50, but they were very small. They were within a department store, for example, and that model wasn't working very well. It was expensive, so they've decided to really focus on Japan uh, more so than anywhere else outside the country. They have a catalog business in Canada, but Japan is really the big opportunity that they told me they see. Lori Valigra is an economy and business reporter at the Bangor Daily News. You can find her recent article about L.L. Bean in Japan on nextnewengland.org. Thanks so much, Lori. I appreciate it. Thank you. The executive producer of Next is Katie Talarski. Production help this week from Lily Tyson and Ali Oshinsky. Our digital producer is Carlos Mejia. Our theme music is by composer Todd Merrill. You can hear more of his music at toddmerrill.com. Thanks also to Goodnight Blue Moon for their song, New England. The New England News Collaborative is funded in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting with support from Douglas Stone and Mary Schwab Stone through the Smart Family Foundation of New York 
and the Melville Charitable Trust. It's powered by WBUR Boston, Vermont Public Radio, New Hampshire Public Radio, Maine Public Radio, Rhode Island Public Radio, WSHU Public Radio Group, New England Public Radio, and Connecticut Public Radio.